It's the Cube. Now, here's your host, Stu Miniman. Hi, this is Stu Miniman with Wikibon with a special presentation of the Cube here at the ribbon cutting at Infinidat's new briefing center in Waltham, Massachusetts. Uh, excited to have with me Brian Carmody, who's the CTO of Infinidat. Uh, Brian, thanks for joining me. Hey, Stuart, how you doing? I'm, I'm doing great. So uh, we, we, we've talked to some of your team here, got on the inside. So here we're, we're, we're outside, but we're going to be digging into some of the innards of what's going on uh, in the industry. So, and, you know, Brian, you know, not much has been going on in the storage industry. Let me see. In the last month, we had the you know uh, finalization of the largest kind of acquisition slash merger in the industry of technology with Dell buying EMC and Nutanix uh, just IPO'd. So, uh, you know, when we've got the CTO, we always want to kind of dig in, you know, what, what's in your head? What, what are the big kind of mega trends that you're seeing and how's that impact uh, what you're doing? Yeah, so this was, obviously it's been a crazy <laughs> era of innovation for us. I mean, even just looking back at the past two years, you know, 2016, or let's say 2015 was kind of the, the year that storage got fast. It was the year that NAND flash hit the knee of the adoption curve, and every marketing person everywhere was hashtag AFA. And then 2016 was kind of the year we think that storage got commoditized. This was when software defined and hyperconverged technologies kind of hit the knee of the adoption curve. It was capped, just like 2015 was capped by the Pure IPO, 2016 was capped by the Nutanix IPO. So I think it's a really interesting question of what comes next? Like, what's the next mountain that we're going to climb as an industry? And we're hearing really interesting things from customers about what their priorities and what their challenges are. So, first off, going into 2017, one of the really interesting phenomenon is that the requirements from traditional enterprise, let's say a, a CTO of a bank that's building a next generation data center versus a mega cloud provider, those re requirements are starting to converge. So this idea that the cloud is one thing and enterprise is something else, I think we're starting to kind of move past that. Obviously there's a huge trend still going on for compute heavy workloads to move off premise into, into public clouds. And a kind of a net flow of storage heavy workloads tend to move on premise. But I think we're at the point now where we're kind of reaching an equilibrium point um, be be between those two. So that is certainly one trend. Another thing that we're hearing very much about is the, um, the rise of new KPIs for measuring IT systems. Acquisition cost is still a big piece of the equation but new technologies or new, new, um, new metrics like power, space, and cooling are becoming very critically important because with the transition to the cloud, even CIOs of very large Fortune 500 companies, their computations are often happening for the first time now in spaces where they are a tenant in someone else's kit. They are renting space or renting capacity. So all of this is putting a lot of pressure on systems designers to really focus on density of storage and density of computation. And um, you know, we see that this is contributing to the rise of a new class of storage technologies called hyper-storage systems, which are designed to to meet those goals. All right. So, so Brian, I, I, I'm. I've tried to create different market categories before. Uh, we, when I joined Wikibon, it was hyperscale invades invade the enterprise. Um, when people before they were talking about hyperconverged as much, uh, we talked about we called it server SAN actually because it was you know the benefits of a SAN brought to the server. Um, but you know so you've got that term hyper in there. Is that hyperscale? Is it hyperconverged? Is it some other you know hyperness? Uh, you know what what what's what's the general idea you're trying to get for this hmm. new category? Yeah, so let's take a look at kind of the existing commercially available technologies. And it's kind of interesting to look at it and think about it on a two-dimensional axis of looking at the density and then the latency. So you have the, for example, the traditional monoliths. These are low, latency that's low enough for primary storage. They do not tend to be very dense. You know, they're under a petabyte of storage per rack. 
And that's where the industry began. That's what a lot of us kind of cut our teeth on. They're being superseded by all flash arrays. These are higher density because they have data reduction technologies built in natively into their data paths. They have better latency, so they're kind of moving up and to the right with respect to the monoliths. But they come at a price, and they tend to be exceedingly expensive um, and relatively small systems. Then you have the SDS and the server storage and the scale out stuff. They tend to be very close to the density of the monoliths. Again, a half a bet half a petabyte to a petabyte per rack. A regression on latency, but they're being widely adopted because the costs are just so much better than the monoliths and the AFAs. And that's the entire enterprise storage industry right in this area here. Now, all the way down if you move uh, to higher density, you have systems like the Facebook Open Vault. So this is you know, an awesome open source uh, storage system that, um, that Facebook developed at the basis of Haystack and F4, two of the largest storage systems in the world right now. These are incredibly dense storage systems, multiple petabytes per rack, but they're very high latency. They're used for cold data only. And other things like Amazon Glacier and whatnot are kind of all clustered down in that high latency, but super dense. So hyperstorage is, if you move around that two-dimensional chart, is the upper right-hand quadrant. It is storage technology that has the reliability of monoliths. It has the cost structure, the programmability, and the, the ability to run on any type of hardware that the SDS systems have. But it has the density and the data center profile of the hyperscaler storage. So this is completely uncharted territory. This is where all of the R&D spend at companies like Google and Amazon, everybody's racing to try to go figure this out. And uh, this is the kind of wild west where we operate. We have a three year head start um, on the on-prem part of this, but it's not gonna last because um, this is, you know, it's the remaining uncharted territory in the industry. Really interesting. So you, you've heard it first, hyper storage. Uh, definitely something I've been hearing for a number of years is especially the big financial guys have been, uh, they've had hyperscale envy uh, is really what it was. They're like, you know, we spend huge amounts of budgets on IT. You know, we know our stuff. How dare, you know, a bunch of retail guys basically, uh, you know, come in here and think that they understand this space. So um, it, it sounds like you're, you're bringing some of that back to them. Um, you know, is Infinidat the only ones, you know, you, you, you mentioned some of the, uh, you know, kind of Google and Facebook. Uh, are there anybody else that's kind of packaging this uh, for the enterprise other than Infinidat? Not yet. So the, um, some of the, of our competitors that are building their systems out of all flash technologies are moving in the right direction, but their, their media itself has to become a lot more dense and the cost has to drop significantly until they can be realistic plays. And until then, it's gonna be differentiated by scale. When you wanna do petabyte scale stuff, you do it with, arc with hyper storage architectures. And when you wanna be small and tight and fast, you do it with AFAs. But I think those lines will be blurred over time. Great. Uh, so it, it, it sounds like you've got a clear differentiation compared to kind of just the, the, the software defined pieces uh, don't deliver on, you know, some of the density uh, that you're talking about or uh, some of the high level performance. When we start getting things like uh, NVMe, I hear is going to be a game changer for uh, the, the, the hyperscale pieces. Do, do we start to see the blurring of the lines between some of these architectures or is this something that, you know, two years from now you're going to say, okay, here's the, the last wave and, and here's the next wave? Yeah, so I mean, if you take a longer view, and instead of two years, I mean, if we if we look at a five and a 10 year view, this is all there is going forward. There's hyperscale architectures or disaggregated architectures, which are for compute heavy storage light workloads. And then you have hyper storage, which is for storage heavy compute neutral workloads. And going forward, if you take a 10, a ten year window, that's all there is out there. 
Well, Brian, I'm hoping we can do a whiteboard with you sometime in the future, or uh, maybe there'll be some kind of, you know, uh, thesis on, uh, you know, the kind of the hyperscale, uh, the, the, the hyper storage category. Uh, but appreciate you here sharing it with our audience here. I uh, want to give you the final word uh, as to kind of, you know, the, the hard work that still needs to be done uh, in the storage industry over the next few years. Go Patriots. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we'll drop the mic there. Uh, thank you, Brian, so, so, so much for joining us. Uh, and thank you for watching theCUBE.